Hi, it's The Wire. It is February 20th, 2024. Gamblersadvisory.com, also bettingangle.us. You know, in my favorites folder is one of the most important fights of my boxing fandom. Right? This fight has guided a lot of how I see boxing. I um, saw clips from the fight years ago. Uh, I feel fortunate to have this particular clip. It's a fight between the gold standard, Sugar Ray Robinson, and fellow Hall of Famer, Randy Turpin. It's the rematch, right? This fight takes place less than 70 days after Randy Turpin shocked everyone by beating Sugar Ray Robinson, who before then had only lost to the Raging Bull, Jake LaMotta. Now, if you ever want to put your partner to sleep, talk about your betting philosophy and talk about what has guided you. I just wanted to share this since I came across the video, since I'm able to put it in my favorites folder. I just wanted to share this 1951 fight with the boxing hardcore here online. But first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now let's turn orthodoxy on its head. As I said, this fight more than 99% of the other fights has a special place for me because it highlights two things that I believe in in making bets. Right, folks? The fascinating part of this fight is not Ray Robinson. The fascinating part of this fight is Hall of Famer Brandy Turpin. Right, so you're about to make a bet. You want an edge on the casino, really an edge on the public. Dwyer's first rule is that the flaws make the diamond. Right, it's when you're looking at some athlete, whatever the sport is, and something just seems off. Right, there's an offbeat part to the athlete. You know what's orthodox. You know the supposed right way to do things. And this guy just doesn't have mastery over one of those aspects. Right? I'm just telling you, I've watched... Here's an example. I've watched basketball a long time. One of the absolute best players I've ever seen. If this guy was on the court, just add 10 points to his team. Right? One of the most valuable players I've ever seen was Jason Kidd. And as I make this video, I can't say Jason Kidd was a great shooter. Right? They used to call him Asen because he didn't have a J. I can't say Jason Kidd was a leaper. I can't say Jason Kidd was the best athlete on his team. But yet you understood that Jason Kidd was bringing a certain dynamic that others couldn't bring. Jason Kidd was adding value somehow that others couldn't add. And the reason why it's important is that the people around you didn't see it. So you'd be able to just know the New Jersey Jet uh, Nets you, you just knew they were going to overperform. Jason Kidd got them to the NBA Finals multiple times. Right? That might shock some people. Right? You understood. Jason Kidd is a big part, a huge part, of Dallas winning an NBA championship. Well, in boxing, just to understand, the flaws make the diamond. You're looking at a fighter, and he's not the athlete the other fighter is. He's awkward. He's throwing awkward punches. Folks, that's a fighter you need to watch closely. If the guy's successful and you're having a hard time figuring it out, 
that might be the guy to bet on. The other Dwyer rule here, and a lot of it comes from this fight, is that can you actually prepare for the guy? Right? Think about football today. Right? You've seen classic drop back quarterbacks, right? Peyton Manning, Tom Brady come to mind just recently. Right? Kurt Warner. Right? You, you understood. These guys are going to stay in the pocket and deliver the football. They're going to stay in the pocket. They're going to read the field. Option one, covered. Option two, covered. Option three, covered. Let me hit the running back. Option four, coming out of the backfield. Right? How do you, in practice, prepare for a Pat Mahomes? Folks, he's a passer. He's thrown for 5,000 yards in a season. But yet, the guy is mobile. Worse yet, the guy is mobile in a way where he's not even trying to run the football. He's just mobile running around the pocket. Can you even use the word, the pocket, in talking about Pat Mahomes? Right? He's sliding along the line of scrimmage. His receivers and tight end know they need to check in with him during plays because they understand whatever the script is, this guy is going to improv part of it. And of course, he has a gun. He's not a running quarterback. No, this is a moving quarterback. So let's talk about this fight. Let's just give a little backstory. Then let's analyze the film. Let me say, too, that this film, you're particularly blessed watching. Because Rocky Marciano is giving his insights, and you understand that Rocky Marciano, one of history's more enigmatic champions, right? You realize that Rocky Marciano has absolutely no idea, and I mean none whatsoever, what it's like to be on your back foot. Right, listen to his commentary. <laughs> listen to his commentary. Understanding that Randy Turpin is a major puncher. Right, that's how he gets in the Hall of Fame. He's a major puncher. And Rocky at times is saying, hey, look, why is Ray Leonard, excuse me, why is Ray Robinson leaving him alone? He said, you should be on him. Right? It would be like Tyson or David Benavides giving boxing advice here. So let's talk about it. Now, like Superman has to deal with kryptonite from time to time, many great fighters have their boogeyman. By a boogeyman, I mean that fighter that for whatever reason seems to be their huckleberry, seems to be able to to beat them, right? Thomas the Hitman Hearns, folks, was beaten twice by Iran Barkley, right? Anthony Joshua still has not figured out how to deal with Alexander Usyk, right? It's so bad, folks, that matchup is so much of a mismatch that an argument can be made that in their first fight, Usyk's best round was the 12th round. Understand, we were excited in the ninth round of the second fight. They'd already fought 12 rounds and eight rounds in the second fight. We were excited when Anthony Joshua showed life in the ninth round of their second fight, only to have Usyk snatch even those moments away from him in the 10th round of that fight. Right? Understand how hungry the crowd was. You hear the buzz in the ninth round of Joshua's second fight against Usyk, who doesn't hit as hard as Joshua, isn't physically as big as Joshua. You got the feeling Joshua could jump in the pocket and toss him around like a rag doll. Folks, Joshua is so overwhelmed by the moment, he can't even throw left hooks. 
Well, let's talk about Ray Robinson. And this is important to know, right? We're going to get outside the norm here a little bit and talk about personality. Now, according to folklore, the Mafia wanted Ray Robinson, who was not just great as a pro. He is amateur boxing's golden boy. Understand, Robinson is the gold standard as an amateur, right? In much the same way, he was the gold standard as a pro. So this is a guy who really from day one is special. So according to folklore, Mr. Gray, you might know him as Frankie Carbo, wanted Ray Robinson to throw a fight, a professional fight. Robinson refused. If you believe the folklore, that led to Robinson not getting a title shot for some period of time. Right now, understand how infiltrated the sport of boxing was with mob guys. In the comment section of this video, I'm going to place a link to a photo of Ray Robinson standing next to Frank Palermo, the infamous Blinky Palermo. Right? Blinky Palermo, for those who don't know, is the person who supposedly fixed the Billy Fox versus Jake LaMotta fight that's featured in Martin Scorsese's The Raging Bull movie. Right? Palermo's a fixer. Understand, the mob decided at some point to leave Ray Robinson alone. Right? Understand, too, Ray Robinson fights a few times in Chicago even though he's a New Yorker. Even though he had a huge following in New York. Right? The rumors are that there was some part of an agreement where Ray had to go on the road for some big fights. Because Ray would not play ball with the mob. Understand, too, that even though Ray takes a little bit longer to get his first title shot, especially given his amateur pedigree, Ray ends up winning the championship anyway. Right? Now, understand, and this is foundational, you know that fighter who is always in the gym? Right now, let's name one. I'm not saying this guy's always in shape or always prepared or always motivated, but he's always around the gym. Tyson Fury. Right? I would argue, too, that if you've ever listened to Mike Tyson, Tyson in his prime used to actually be a boxing commentator. And I'm telling you that Mike Tyson was one of the best boxing commentators I've ever heard. You could tell that Mike Tyson lived and breathed boxing, right? Mike Tyson is the kind of guy who could talk at length about lightweight champion Benny Leonard, right? You just sense that certain fighters are heavily into the sport. They spend their free time in the gym. Tyson Fury spends his free time in the gym. You can sense that boxing provides structure to his life, right? So just like Mike Tyson was in an alley uptown with Mitch Green after hours, you could tell that Tyson Fury, who's had problems outside the ring, weight gain, substance abuse, according to reports, you could tell that boxing brings structure to their lives. Ray Robinson is a different personality. Ray Robinson is not in love with boxing. He's great at it. Right? He's phenomenal at it. But this is the guy who sees himself as an entrepreneur. Right? That's his real passion, folks. He just happens to be blessed in boxing as an amateur and as a pro. Right? So understand Robinson, this is during his career, 
owns several stores in Harlem, right? Main part of Harlem, too. We're talking about 7th Avenue, 123rd Street, if you know Manhattan, right? Ray Robinson has several stores in Harlem. Understand the level of entrepreneur that he was. He owned Golden Gloves Barbershop. He owned Sugar Ray's Quality Cleaners. He owned Edna May's Lingerie Store. In other words, Robinson is the entrepreneur who's a boxer who thinks to himself, you know, women also are consumers. Right, let me have this lingerie store. Understand, when you think Ray Robinson, you should think of Babe Ruth. It's the same type of personality. Right, there's a roommate of Babe Ruth's who claims that what he knew of Babe was that Babe was a good guy, but he really was just a roommate with Babe's suitcase. Right? Because Babe Ruth was out womanizing. Babe Ruth wasn't the hardcore baseball guy that other people were. And understand, Babe Ruth, pitcher, as well as great slugger later in his career. Right? Ray Robinson is your man about town. Right? He's a womanizer. He is a businessman. Understand, Ray's prized business was his nightclub. Ray Robinson is the black man in the 1950s driving around in a flamingo pink Cadillac and he would park that Cadillac in front of his nightclub where people like Nat King Cole, Lena Horne, Frank Sinatra, Joe DiMaggio, would hang out, right? That's the real Ray Robinson. And of course, nobody touched that pink Cadillac. Everyone knew who drove it. Robinson was the guy who could drive the pink Cadillac and have no one question his manhood in Harlem, right? Now that's who the guy really is. Understand, he's touring through Europe with Gordon Parks, the photographer, who would later, in the early 70s, direct Shaft, breakthrough movie, black detective, uh, had the dope Isaac Hayes soundtrack, Richard Roundtree is Shaft, right? That's the movie where the studio comes to Gordon Parks and says, hey, we need for Roundtree to shave off his mustache. And Parks tells the studio why. He's not shaving off his mustache. So understand, at different time, people are cheering Shaft in the early 70s because it's a black man in the lead character with a mustache. And of course, the Afro, right? Roundtree used to be a hair model before he was Shaft. Well, understand that Gordon Parks, whose son, by the way, did Superfly. That Gordon Parks is hanging around with Ray Robinson in Europe. And according to Gordon Parks, Ray was doing more golfing than he was preparing for his fight against Randy Turpin. Right? According to Folklore 2, Ray Robinson, who loved being around people, is out with his group. He's someplace in France. And he runs into some maitre d' someplace. And it's the maitre d' who looks at Robinson's group and asks him who is in his entourage. That's how the word entourage enters the boxing lexicon, according to legend. Well, anyway, let me just say this. Robinson, who's 129 wins and one loss with two draws at the time of the first Turpin fight, gets beaten over 12 rounds by Randy Turpin. Right? Robinson, who was a man in many ways. Right? Real role model type dude. Solid dude. Um, in some ways. Awful dude in other ways. Right? But just understand, Robinson admitted after the fight that he lost to Randy Turpin. Right? This was news. Robinson had a rematch clause. They fight less than 70 days later. 
in New York City. Right, folks? 60,000 people show up at the polo grounds. That's the poll Ray Robinson had in 1951. Let me say this as diplomatically as I can. Boxing has a few figures who can fill stadiums. Life's unfair, right? You heard me mention Anthony Joshua earlier. He can fill stadiums, right? I'm just telling you, there have been great fighters, literally better fighters than Anthony Joshua during Joshua's career in his weight class. I believe Tyson Fury is a better fighter today than Anthony Joshua, right? Let's not kid ourselves. Joshua can fill stadiums. Whoever the boxing king is of the heavyweight division, the box office king is a different person. It's Anthony Joshua. Nobody else is competitive with him. Right? We can talk about 168. We can talk about some great fighters. I think Benavides is a great fighter. Right, folks? You understand the box office king at 168 is Canelo. You understand if Canelo went to 175, a division with Bevel, who beat Canelo, a division with Peturbia, if you understand Canelo would be the box office king at 175. Right now, you've had some great fighters in history. Let me say this as clearly as possible. Floyd Mayweather is one of the best fighters I have ever seen. But there's a charisma gap, and you see it here knowing that on less than 70 days notice, 60,000 people come out for Ray Robinson. You understand that if Mayweather were to fight Ray Robinson at 147, where we assume Robinson's the best in history, right? Look at the record. Look at the years of dominance. There would be a charisma gap. Right? Maybe Mayweather is the better fighter than Ray Robinson. Maybe. Right? Mayweather certainly has the better defense. Mayweather's athleticism matches anybody's in the sport. Right? But just to understand, there'd be a charisma gap. Right? People like Lena Horn are going to Ray Robinson's nightclub. Right? That's the level of pull. Right? Frank Sinatra is going to Ray Robinson's nightclub. Right? Ray is touring around Europe. Gordon Parks is hanging out with him. Right? Life's unfair. Ray Leonard. I was alive during the Ray Leonard era. Right? Just to understand, Ray Leonard hardly fights for most of the 1980s. Right? I'm telling you, Ray Leonard called a press conference in the middle of the 1980s when he hadn't fought for some time. Folks, that was major news in the world of sports. It was a press conference on what Ray was going to do in the future. I'm not kidding. Marvin Hagler showed up for it. Right At the press conference, Ray announced that he was staying retired. We were all bummed. That sports story led the sports report. Right, Understand, charisma is hard to define. If Ray Leonard were to have fought Floyd Mayweather, prime against prime. Right, I'm just telling you, I just know, having lived through both eras, knowing that Floyd Mayweather's nickname was Money, Knowing that Floyd Mayweather had purses Ray Leonard can't even dream of, right? In part due to great people around him, Al Heyman, right? Great financial mind. Well, just to understand, I have no doubt in terms of who's loved. Just like a fight between Tyson Fury and Anthony Joshua would have a huge section of the crowd rooting for AJ. I'm just telling you, Ray Robinson, Ray Leonard would be the crowd favorites against Floyd Mayweather, right? Let's get back to this. 
So, let me just say, history, and this is how history is, remembers Randy Turpin more for the way he died. Google that. It's important. I'm not going to mention it here because it would drown out the rest of the video. Let me also point out, too, this is going to be a long video. History remembers Randy Turpin more for the way he died than for the fighter he was, which is unfortunate. Folks, Randy Turpin is a puncher's puncher, right? He famously wins the British Light Heavyweight Championship from Don Cockle, who outweighed him by 12 pounds. Understand, Turpin was such a puncher that he fights for the 175-pound title at 162 pounds against Cockle, who was such a rough guy that Cockle would later go on to fight heavyweight champion Rocky Marciano. And if you remember or if you've read about Marciano's reign, you know that that Don Cockle Rocky Marciano fight is one of the most rough and tumble fights of Marciano's heavyweight reign. Well, just understand, Cockle, the tough guy, lost to Randy Turpin, who wasn't even within 10 pounds of him. Right? Turpin, of course, beats Cockle by stoppage. That's the level of puncher we're talking about. Now, this fight film, if you're a gambler, is significant. As I said, Randy Turpin is the real story here. You need to look at the film and you need to ask yourself, how is Randy Turpin hanging with Ray Robinson? As you look at this film, understand Turpin has already beaten Robinson the first time they faced each other. Let me let you in on a secret too. The first fight, Turpin opens a cut over Robinson's left eye. Right? Just understand in the second fight, he opens a cut over Robinson's left eye. Tyson Fury fans need to think about this. Same place, same cut. Right? Now, here, it's a little severe because they're fighting each other just two months after the first fight. But understand, these are the days of 15-round fights. Understand, Turpin is a blessed puncher. Turpin has five rounds, in fact, six rounds, because the cut opens in the ninth. To make that cut so bad that the referee has no choice but to stop the fight. In other words, this is a cut that could lead to the fight being stopped at any time. Now for gamblers, the big question here again is, how is Turpin competitive? Please focus on that. If you figure out the answer to that question, it'll give you the leg up on the public in betting on fights, right? It's like asking the question, how is Jason Kidd so effective? Let's talk about the dynamics of the fight. And please, look at the film in my favorites folder. Watch portions, stop, rewind. It's a condensed version of the fight that's narrated by Rocky Marciano. This is how they package fights in the past for the public. Now understand, Turpin is noticeably slower than Ray Robinson in foot speed and hand speed. Folks, it's noticeable, right? Robinson, of course, great legs, light on his feet, great jab, great balance, right? Two-handed, throws an excellent straight right hand, right? You see Ray's game. He looks spectacular. He's struggling here, folks. Now understand, it's fascinating because as you look at the film, you realize that Randy Turpin 
while he could take one step back and throw a punch. You understand that Turpin's back foot is underdeveloped. If he takes two steps back, he can't throw any punches. Right? This is the 1950s. Right? Back feet are underdeveloped. Let me just say, one wonders in this fight, given that Robinson is a puncher, and I know Rocky Marciano disagrees with that on the telecast or the fight clip, but understand, given that Ray Robinson is a puncher, one wonders why Ray Robinson didn't just bum rush Randy Turpin as Turpin backs away from the pocket because Turpin has no offense once he puts down that second foot has no offense so that tells me that Turpin hits so hard on his first step back that Ray Robinson didn't want to risk getting hit with something well let's just say Turpin far from perfect can't throw punches two steps after backing up, underdeveloped back foot, noticeably slower than Ray Robinson. Let's talk about what he does well. First, folks, he's brave. Here he is against a faster-handed guy with a great jab. And Turpin has a pocket form. They're fighting in the pocket. Right, Turpin is fighting a guy who has over a hundred wins, who is a legendary fighter during his career. And Randy Turpin is okay with it. He's not trying to run. A pocket forms. Randy Turpin is cool in the pocket, knowing he's fighting the faster fighter. Let me also say too, Turpin, and this fight is one of boxing's best moments of this, Turpin is an excellent clincher. One wonders how so many people fought Ray Robinson and no one else, and I mean this, no one else was able to clinch him like this. Whenever Robinson gets going, Turpin can clinch him on demand. Turpin just takes a step forward and clinches him. You also realize that, and this is one of the secrets to Francis and Ganu. You also realize that Turpin has a strong core. Maybe these guys weigh the same. Turpin is clearly the stronger fighter. Right? Robinson can't just get in the pocket and move Turpin. Right? Turpin's hard to move. You notice, too, that Turpin, who's as awkward as hell, folks, he's awkward as hell. But you notice that the awkwardness hides a great upper body. He can move his upper body out of the way. How do you let a pocket form in front of Ray Robinson and not be bothered by his jab? Folks, Turpin's not bothered by Robinson's jab. Understand, it's Robinson who, both fights, gets cut above his eye. Not Randy Turpin. Right, Turpin is there. Robinson's throwing his jab. You notice Turpin, while standing in front of Robinson, has his upper body on a swivel. He's hiding his upper body. He can move his upper body in such a way where the jab ends here. Let me also say this, and I don't say it lightly. You know, fighters who try to jab their way in and stuff like that, folks, this tape is how to lead with power shots. Turpin's not just leaning away from Robinson's jab in the pocket. Turpin is throwing wicked lead power shots. He's not trying to jab his way in on Robinson. That would take too much awareness of Robinson's rhythm. No, he's imposing himself on Robinson. He's throwing hard shots. And let me just point out, Turpin is throwing shots from the weirdest angles imaginable. Right? He can 
stiffen his arm and throw shots from odd angles. Tim Zhu has this capability. The champ at 154. But even Tim Zhu would look at this Turpin film and ask himself, what the hell is Randy doing? So Randy is throwing hard shots. He throws great body shots. Right? They're withering. And he can also get around Ray Robinson's defense by standing in front of him and throwing these wide, wide power shots with both hands. He's two-handed. Let me also say this, and look at the film closely. This doesn't leap out at you first, but Ray Robinson does a great job of circling Randy Turpin. Right, Robinson? Robinson has deceptive movement. He's not dancing Ali style, Larry Holmes style. Now, this is a guy who just circles you intuitively, and he can circle you both ways. Randy Turpin is not thrown off by the circling. In other words, Turpin, who's really a puncher, who leads with power shots, who can move his upper body and dip away from jabs. As he's being circled, Turpin has no problem picking up his legs and circling, you know, tracking the fighter who's circling him. Right? So let me just say this. This is an important film for gamblers. Because I believe the public sees a Ray Robinson and the brilliance leaps off the page at you, right? It's like watching Peyton Manning. He comes to the line, he's saying, Omaha, Omaha, you understand he's reading the defense. He fades back in the pocket. You see him read his progression, right? The public can understand that better than it can a young Joe Montana who doesn't have great arm strength, who, unlike Brady and Peyton Manning, was a running quarterback early in his career and is moving around the pocket a bit like Pat Mahomes. Right? If you can sense a dynamic in a fighter that might not be obvious to the public, you might have an edge on the public in betting on the fighter. So let's just say this. This second fight, Randy Turpin against Ray Robinson. Understand, legacies turn on these moments. Not only is the fight competitive, and keep in mind, this is after Turpin already beat Robinson by decision. Not only is the fight competitive when it ends, but understand, Ray Robinson has a wicked cut that a referee could have used to stop the fight at any time at the end of the fight. And understand, it's a 15-round fight. Turpin, a puncher, had other rounds to deal with Robinson's eye. Understand, too, possession matters in boxing. It's Randy Turpin who's the champ in the rematch. So Robinson can't just run and hide. Robinson has to be around the pocket with this bad cut. So, of course, it's only in boxing that Robinson, the puncher, sits down on his punches and is able to score arguably the most important KO of his career. Right? The stoppage is warranted. Robinson rose to the occasion. But just to understand, one and a half fights in. More than one and a half fights in. This is the 10th round of the rematch. Ray Robinson still did not reach a point where he was dominating Randy Turpin until the final exchange. Robinson, of course, walks away with the stoppage win. We as gamblers walk away with a fight that opens the door to questions on how a guy who's slower than Ray Robinson 
foot speed, hand speed. How a guy who's fighting in front of 60,000 fans who are really there for Ray. They're not there for Randy Turpin. This is in New York after Ray had lost in Europe. Right? One wonders how Randy Turpin is holding his own. I'm just telling gamblers here, you figure out the answer to that question. And you'll be standing alone in line at casinos making winning bets. Right? The public is going to think that you're crazy. As you pick guys and get ridiculous odds on quality guys who might not fit in according to boxing orthodoxy. Randy Turpin's a Hall of Famer. He had many great fights. You understand, looking at this film, that it's impossible to prepare for him. Right? Ray Robinson is a classic boxer many have imitated. Right? If you're a jab man, if you believe in jabs, right? If you're a Lennox Lewis, you understand that one of the best jabs in history belonged to Ray Robinson. Rocky Marciano on the telecast mentions it. Right? Understand, the term pound for pound became part of the boxing lexicon because of Ray Robinson. Just understand that Ray Robinson had a problem with an awkward Randy Turpin. Twice. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. The video's in my favorites folder with Marciano's very fascinating commentary. Uh, let me also say, too, at what point Anthony Quinn drops in, and it's stunning to see Anthony Quinn in 1951 look as old as he did. I was watching Anthony Quinn on TV in the 80s, folks, right? It's, it's interesting seeing him as an older man in the early 50s. Anyway, those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.